Charles Walker Haggard, the good-looking man sitting next to the very good-looking woman. <laughs> Charles Walker Haggard is my grandfather, and he was the man who greatly inspired my curiosity about the history of Freemasonry. He was born in 1911 in Toronto. He was a member and past master of the Barton Lodge in Hamilton, a member of the Scottish Rite in Hamilton, and a founding member and past master of Sunny Lee Lodge in Toronto. When he passed away at the age of 97, he'd been a Mason for over 65 years. And while he used to tell us, with great pomp and importance, that he was a Mason of the 64th degree, <laughs> my brother, who is one of two of my brothers, who is also a brother, confirmed that Charles Haggard was a Mason of the 32nd degree. Not quite as impressive, but very impressive nonetheless. On the occasion of his 65th anniversary as a Mason, my parents hosted a large gathering of Masons at their house here in St. Catharines, and I recall quite distinctly thinking that my grandfather had better bling than I did. When he was arrayed in his Masonic regalia, he could hardly hold himself upright. Freemasonry was an important and sustaining part of my grandfather's life, and it became, as a result, something important and sustaining to our entire family. And for me, always too curious, and I'm sure he would tell you always a little too nosy, the history of Freemasonry has become of increasing importance in my life as an historian. Charles Haggard passed away a few months before the inaugural Sankey Lecture in 2010, but he was keenly interested and very proud when he heard of the legacy that Freemasonry had granted this institution. He may have thwarted all of my efforts to rifle his own papers and books about the craft, but that never stopped him from encouraging curiosity, learning, and the pursuit of enlightenment. This lecture series and the Sankey Collection itself is a celebration of another life well lived, but it has also become the foundation for the expansion of knowledge and enlightenment that my grandfather always encouraged. It allows students, faculty, and visiting researchers of Brock University the opportunity to connect with scholars across the continent and to broaden the horizons of our own understanding of the significance of fraternalism. I'd like to say a few words today about those broadening horizons here at Brock and to give you a sense of how the Sankey Collection is allowing me to offer new insights into a subject which is of increasing importance here in Niagara and across the country, and I'm speaking here, of course, of the War of 1812. <clears throat> my personal curiosity about Freemasonry, <clears throat> inspired by my grandfather and sustained by my two brothers' membership in the craft, has intersected with my research interests about two years ago when I embarked on the study of the War of 1812. I'm not a military historian, nor am I a political historian, so the kinds of books that are out there about this war didn't give the answers that I, myself, am looking for. My own research questions are about the experience, the experience of soldiering for Americans as much as for Canadians and for the British. My questions are about the tensions between soldiers and civilians, about the spiritual beliefs of the fighting men, their understanding of the causes of the war they were fighting, and the ways that they coped with the violence, the cold, the hunger, the injury, the illness, and the loneliness that are so often the bedfellows of fighting men. This is the war, many have claimed, that forged this country. But it did so through these men and through their lives, and so these questions are extraordinarily pertinent, not just, just to our understanding of the War of 1812, but to the history of Canada, and certainly to the history of our relationship with the United States. Some of these men coped with prayer, Others coped by deserting, many of them coped by drinking too much, but many more than have ever been recognized, I believe, found solace and friendship within their Masonic lodges. Whether American, British, or Canadian, and indeed whether First Nations or immigrant, Masonic lodges were ubiquitous on both sides of the border prior to and during the conflict. In this particular region, in fact, <clears throat> lodges were often the first buildings that were constructed in new settlements, and whether here or in the United States, they were important centers of civic life within their settlements, as happened in Queenston, now, uh, which was then known as Newark. Uh, this is what happened when the lodge was founded in 1791. It ended up doubling as a school, a church, and a meeting house, which was very common. These lodges were also the places where brothers from both sides of the border met on a regular basis. Freemasonry was a unifying force for diverse populations of Americans, Canadians, British, Irish, German, First Nations, Dutch, and Scottish settlers, 
and cross-border exchanges over the Niagara River were as common as the cross-cultural exchanges within individual Masonic lodges. Indeed, Masons have been doing this kind of cross-border connecting far longer and with far more effectiveness than most historians, and if 1812 is any example, far better than most politicians. But what happens when political and military conflict intervenes and cuts off those lines of connection? What happens when members of the same family, in this case the family of Freemasonry, are sent to war against one another? And this is part of my research project. Alan Taylor, a historian from the United States, has referred to this as a civil war. Among the hundreds of names that I have uncovered showing how members of lodges on both sides of the border were engaged in battle against one another, it was much more than a civil war. It was a family feud, and it was a conflict that profoundly altered the lives and ended many of them of individual Freemasons. Much of what we know about the experience of the War of 1812, in fact, has come to us through the eyes of Masonic brothers. This is certainly the case with one of the incidents that rents the heart of any Canadian patriot, the sacking of York in April of 1813. In the earliest moments of dawn on April 27th of this year, a group of about 1,700 intrepid American soldiers and sailors made their way across the border, across Lake Ontario, uh, into Canada <clears throat> in a rather impressive flotilla. Their destination was the capital of Upper Canada, York, which we now call Toronto, a little bit smaller then, as you can see from the painting. <laughs> and their intentions were not benevolent or brotherly. <clears throat> Reaching the coastline a short distance from Fort York, the gunships wrought havoc on the British defenses while soldiers landed uh, with the intent of plundering the town. To capture it, if only temporarily, would do lasting harm to the British defenses and to the Canadas and to, the British, and to British morale. And capturing the town was actually a relatively easy thing to do. They were faced by a reluctant local militia, a small local militia, and an unprepared and underarmed British garrison. But in their hasty retreat from the city, the British commander ordered that anything of military value be burned in order to, to deprive the invaders of useful prizes. This included the then under construction hull of a new ship called the Isaac Brock, and the contents of the Grand Magazine at the fort, which you can see here from 1804. The Isaac Rock was burned to ash, but packed with ammunition and black powder, the stone-built Grand Magazine exploded, sending rocks and debris flying through the ranks of the invaders and putting a column of smoke, spewing a column of smoke into the air that could be seen for miles. A U.S. Army surgeon and Freemason by the name of James Mann, a member of the Montgomery Lodge of Milford, Massachusetts, was present to witness at this explosion, and he reported that 60 of the rank and file were killed instantly, and over 180 were, as he wrote, wounded and mangled in a most wretched and deplorable manner. Most of these men later died of their injuries. The scene described by one of man's surgical staff, William Beaumont, who was also a mason from Harmony Lodge in Champlain, New York, captures the horror facing the wounded and those who were tasked with treating them quite graphically. And I'll read to you briefly from his journal. A most distressing scene ensues in the hospital, he wrote. Nothing but the groans of the wounded and agonies of the dying are to be heard. The surgeons are walking in blood and are cutting off arms and legs and trepanning heads to rescue their fellow creatures from untimely deaths. Many of these wounded were Freemasonries, like the men who attempted to heal their, heal their pain, and undoubtedly like those who had been defending the fort when they arrived. One can only imagine how difficult it must have been not only to witness the destruction and death, but to walk among the wounded, whether they were Freemasons or not. Hmm. Masons certainly numbered among the dead as well, including the most prominent victim of this explosion, Brother and Brigadier General Zebulon Montgomery Pike, who is best known for his pre-war daring-do explorations of the American Southwest, and he was a member of Lodge Number no. 3 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was killed at the time of the explosion. As an aside, Pike's body, in what was a fairly common practice, at least for prominent officers killed in battle, like Lord Nelson, he was shipped back to the United States in a barrel of alcohol, probably whiskey, intended to preserve the corpse, corpse so that an appropriate funeral with the requisite Masonic rites could be arranged in Sackett's Harbor. As more than one American soldier recalled with Despair later on, 
Many men on board the ship subsequently drank from the barrel in which Pike had rested. I am sure that none of these imbibers were among the Masons, but I'll let you know if I find out otherwise, and I promise not to tell Dan Brown. <laughs> The battles of 1812, the sacking of York, Queenston Heights, Lake Erie, Chrysler's Farm, Chippewa, Lundy's Lane, Lake Champlain, Baltimore, and New Orleans pitted Mason against Mason. The war effectively rebuilt the border that for decades Masons had so easily and readily crossed without muskets and without malice. But there are also stories, perhaps some of them apocryphal, but even if containing only a single grain of truth, that present an object lesson in the way that fraternalism, that the recognition of common goals and memberships transcended this war. Many of these stories report, for example, that the homes of known Freemasons were avoided when soldiers were plundering civilians for supplies and booty. Other stories suggest that far more than one's possessions could survive if one's membership in a lodge was discovered. For example, in May of 1813, just a few weeks short of the sacking of York, Another group of American soldiers were involved in, attack, in an attack on Fort George, another American victory. I realize as I say this that I'm picking out all American victories, perhaps in deference to our American <laughs> visitor. <laughs> According to one of the more popular stories about this battle, a British soldier who was wounded and about to find himself on the wrong end of an American bayonet gave a Masonic sign of distress. The American captain leading that arm of the invasion recognized the sign and spared the man's life. The hairs on my head stood up and held off my hat, he later recalled, <coughs> suggesting, as one might imagine Beaumont and Mann felt at York, that the recognition of the war's effect on the Brotherhood was disabling, unexpected, and perhaps one of the most challenging aspects of being both a soldier and a mason in this conflict. Interestingly, these acts of transcendence would not have been seen as treasonous as aiding and abetting the enemy or of interfering with the normal course of war. Instead, they emerge in the historical record as stories about gentlemanly behavior and even heroism, and to paraphrase American, express perhaps the benefits of membership. If membership did indeed provide such protections to enemy combatants, then the history of 1812 is incomplete without a more careful reckoning, reckoning of the practice of the craft among the men in the ranks. Crossing borders for them was a different process, a different experience, and one that redefined traditional borders of international conflict and nationalistic posturing. Discovering how and why is what my own historical research, my own plundering of the Sankey collection will attempt to reveal. This is and will continue to be a painstaking progress, pro process, a gradual collection of names, stories, legends, myths, facts, images, and words that reveal a fascinating web of cross-border connection and community foundation across the Niagara River. And it reveals in very profound ways the enormous disruption occasioned by the War of 1812. 1812 has often been seen as a necessary foundation for 200 years of peace along the Canada-US border, but our perceptions of this peace ignore how the war was an unexpected, enduring, and difficult reminder of the border that lay between the people of Canada and the United States. A few years ago, an historian by the name of David Lowenthal argued that the past is a foreign country. This is, as far as my research is concerned, very accurate. The language and practices of Freemasonry present interpretive challenges for an historian, especially one whose grandfather was so protectively quiet. And delving into the Sankey collection here at Brock and into the Masonic archives elsewhere is akin to landing in a foreign country and attempting to learn the language on the fly. Not only this, it's an attempt to learn the geography and language of that country when the maps are incomplete, when you can't ever speak to the people who live there or truly see how they lived, why they acted and reacted the ways that they did. Historians become the translators of these foreign countries. They become our tour guides through the customs and ideas of the past. They are the means by which the hidden influences and long forgotten ties that bind us to our pasts are revealed, understood, and either revered or cut. The Sankey Lecture Series, much to my benefit, has introduced me to several of these tour guides 
who have begun to explore and understand these foreign lands and can offer significant signposts and directions as I begin my own journey across the border into the foreign country of Masonry and the War of 1812. One thing that we can know for certain about the experience of this war is that Canadians have not always appreciated it when Americans cross their borders. This afternoon, however, we are honored by the border crossing of Dr. Stephen Bullock. Professor of History, Humanities and Arts at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts, he's a prize-winning author, a noted Masonic scholar, and our honored guest today. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. <laughs> 